Hey guys, Tyler here. Dune is, according to several metrics, the best-selling science fiction novel of all time. And for decades, there's been a lot of impetus to capitalize on the popularity of Frank Herbert's seminal novel and turn it into a film franchise. Famously, Alejandro Jodorowsky tried to make a Dune film in the mid-1970s and got people like H.R. Giger, who worked on Alien, and cast people like Salvador Dali. The film went over budget, of course, and the script was roughly 10 to 14 hours worth of material. Then David Lynch took a crack at it in 1984, and that film did get released but it was a critical and box office bomb, though it has since developed a cult following. There was even a miniseries in the early 2000s. And of course, in 2021, Denis Villeneuve's vision of Dune came to the big screen and to HBO Max, which he wasn't too happy about. But Villeneuve's film, titled Dune Part 1, has renewed interest in the universe, and a sequel, Dune Part 2, was almost immediately announced, set for release in 2024. In this video, I'd like to explore the lore of the Dune universe and attempt to answer the question, how plausible is its future? Let's find out. Dune takes place tens of thousands of years in the future. In the case of the first novel, 21,000 years from now. But about 11,000 years from now, 10,000 years in Dune's past, there was an event called the Butlerian Jihad, a quasi-religious uprising that saw the total destruction of basically any thinking machines. Computers, artificial intelligence, because the people in this time period had become disgusted with how much influence these thinking machines had on their lives. And this Butlerian Jihad also led to the development of a new pan-universal religion codified into a religious text called the Orange Catholic Bible. I kind of like that name, mostly because of the orange. It's also important to note that Dune is a world in which humans have colonized the galaxy. So alongside this pan-universal religion is a pan-galactic feudal empire called the Imperium. And it has reigned for 10,000 years, as of when the first Dune novel starts. There are also several secret societies, including ones like the Bene Gesserit, a sort of matriarchal order that is dedicated to perfecting humanity through selective breeding. And members of the Bene Gesserit possess superhuman mental and physical abilities honed through a lifetime of training. They essentially influence galactic politics, so they're the real source of authority. They control the Emperor, who effectively serves as a figurehead. And they've spent centuries carefully crossing bloodlines by arranging marriages to make sure all these important people only bear daughters. Eventually, they intend for this to lead to the birth of a hypothetical superhuman male called the Kwisatz Haderach. The Bene Gesserit have even spread among the Fremen people of Arrakis the prophecy of a messiah, whom the Fremen call Muad'Dib. Dune protagonist Paul Atreides' mother, Lady Jessica, is a member of the Bene Gesserit, who, by giving birth to a son, has facilitated the birth of the Kwisatz Haderach a generation early, disrupting the Bene Gesserit's carefully calculated plan. When it comes to the everyday administration of the various planets in the Imperium, there's an abundance of great houses, including House Atreides, Paul's house, and historical rulers of the planet Caladan. House Atreides claims descent from King Agamemnon, a son of Atreus, in Greek mythology. House Atreides is ordered by the Emperor to replace House Harkonnen as the fief rulers of the desert planet Arrakis, aka, well, Dune. Arrakis is where most of Dune takes place, and it's the only known source of the spice melange. In addition to being a psychotropic drug, very important to the culture of the native Fremen, it's also what humans in this galaxy use to engage in interstellar travel. You might wonder, how? Well, instead of using computers or AI to guide spaceships, having been gone for 10,000 years, they use mutated navigators who work for the Spacing Guild, which has a monopoly on commerce and trade. The spice induces a higher mental state that allows navigators to, like a quantum computer, observe the probabilistic distribution of outcomes that can get them from point A to point B 
picking the one that is most desirable. This warping of space-time at the quantum level is known as the Holtzman effect. The science of the Holtzman effect is never delved into that much, but it's also what powers shields. Basically, holographic personal body armor, like those seen in later media like Mass Effect. The 2021 film has a really creative visual effect where they show the armor being blue when it's blocking a weapon in close quarter combat, the dominant form of combat in the Dune universe and red when a weapon has penetrated the shielding. Spoilers for Dune. As we see, House Atreides taking over the governing of Arrakis doesn't go well. Paul's father, King Leto, is assassinated, and Leto's family concludes the Emperor set them up to die on Arrakis. The spice is also guarded by giant sandworms called Dune Worms. No, actually, just sandworms. But the Fremen have learned to tame these creatures, who in their larval state, called a sand trout, resemble freshwater leeches. The fungal excretions of the sand trout are what form the basis of spice. And again, it has become incredibly important to the culture of the Fremen. Most sand trout die as part of the natural life cycle of Arrakis, but those who don't eventually grow over millennia into the giant sandworms, which lurk underneath the Arakeen sands. Sand trout have the ability to transform a whole terraformed planet into desert by encapsulating large bodies of water. It's believed that the sand trout were introduced to Arrakis from another planet eons ago, as Arrakis had once been a wet planet, as evidenced by salt beds that were once great seas. While there are no extant intelligent aliens in Dune, the different human colonies spread out across the galaxy might as well be alien to each other, as they've been politically and culturally separated for generations. Dune, of course, explores themes like anti-colonialism, spice being a clear metaphor for Middle Eastern oil, one of several Arab and Islamic influences in Dune. The portion of the universe that is explored and documented by humans in Dune is called the Known Universe. The Imperium claims the vast majority of this territory, the realm of the Padishah emperors, such as Emperor Shaddam Karino IV. The borders of known space are never accurately described, although some projections can be made based on the known locations of stars and basic Dune history. The human race, of course, began on Earth, un unless this is like a, a Battlestar Galactica situation, but it it's probably not and colonized numerous worlds orbiting other stars. These ranged from relatively nearby stars within 20 light years to several stars 100 to 200 light years away from Earth. The furthest known colonized star of the Imperium, Beta Lensis, home of Ischia, is 410 light years away. But even Beta Lensis is well within the Orion arm of the Milky Way. And the Imperium does seem to still be centered on the general region of Earth. The Atreides and Harkonnen homeworlds, Kaladin and Gaiety Prime, are each about 20 light years from Earth, respectively. Kaladin canonically orbits the sun like star Delta Pavonis, whose age, luminosity, metallicity, temperature, and other properties make it a prime target for real-life searches for extraterrestrial intelligence. Delta Pavonis also has a slow rotation rate and minimal magnetic activity, making it the nearest solar analog that is not part of a binary or multiple star system. This calm radiation environment is partly what gives Caladan its lush environment. In real life, Delta Pavonis's high metallicity makes it likelier to harbor a planetary system, with radial velocity data suggesting there are no gas giants in its habitable zone. But a 2023 study hints at a possible gas giant at about 11 astronomical units from the star, about twice as far as Jupiter is, from the Sun. Gaiety Prime orbits a dimmer, red-orange star in the Ophiuchus constellation. The planet has a longer day and orbital period than Earth, and has lower levels of photosynthesis. This is due mainly to the heavy industrialization of the planet under the Harkonnens, though they do maintain some of the planet's natural forests for logging and export. Arrakis is said in the book to orbit the star Canopus, 310 light years away, although I personally consider this unlikely as Canopus is a very young, bright A-type star, only 20 or so million years old. Under known science, 
Canopus would be far too young and too rich a source of x-rays to support carbon-based life. What's ultimately important, though, is that Arrakis is on the very edge of Imperium space. Its atmosphere is very similar in composition to Earth, allowing humans to live on its surface without respiratory equipment. And the sandworm's metabolism also acts as a source of atmospheric oxygen. Besides the sandworms, Arrakis's native life includes the kangaroo mouse, also called Moadib, which is also the name of one of Arrakis's two moons. You, you see the pattern? The Fremen on Arrakis are descended from a population called the Zensuni Wanderers, who millennia ago embarked on an interstellar journey to escape from persecution and enslavement by Imperial raiders. Arrakis is their final stop, and the Fremen have eked out a traditionalist lifestyle on the planet, existing in the caves of rocky outcrops and mountain ranges that break up the planet-wide desert. So the next natural question, the question that I wanted to answer in this video is, do I find Dune to be a plausible future? Well, that's a multifaceted question. My answer is yes and no. First off, I think that any future where humanity colonizes the galaxy or the universe at large is ultimately a positive one. I think it's in the best interest of our species to become a multi-planetary and eventually interstellar species in case something happens to Earth. As for a future where humans are spread out across the galaxy or universe and become politically and culturally separated for thousands of years, I think that's realistic. Assuming, of course, that we eventually figure out how to develop faster than light travel. That said though, even with slower than light travel, if we over thousands of years colonize the galaxy, that would even more so induce this political and cultural separation. One thing that I have some trouble reconciling, though, is the assertion of mind powers. I tried to run from it, but it picked me up with its mind powers and shook me like a doll. It's true! I saw the whole thing! I've talked about this in previous videos, particularly in my video about non-corporeal species in Star Trek. The fact that telekinesis, telepathy, and things of that nature to our best understanding, have no scientific basis. Any experiments to try and prove that telekinesis is real have been riddled with methodological flaws. Do I expect that to change in the future, even 20,000 years from now? I don't really see it, but we have been surprised before. There have been magical technologies that have been invented to aid us in our endeavors and help us do things that we could only dream of hundreds of years ago. But that kind of violates the rule in Dune that you cannot have a thinking machine. Obviously, they have flight control systems and comm systems, as well as holographic educational tools, but these are not artificial intelligence. Having said all that, as others have pointed out, the voice, a means to command others on a subconscious level by modulating the pitch of one's voice, could merely be viewed as a stronger evolution of the power of suggestion, which is, of course, a real phenomenon in our everyday lives. There is one element that I do consider plausible, comparing the Mentats, human computers, or guild navigators to quantum computers. The idea of expanding the capacity of the human brain to perform all sorts of complex calculations is, in some ways, basically what a savant is. There have been notable people throughout history who have been very mathematically inclined and have helped push forward science. It's a little bit more complicated than that, as the human brain is incapable of some of the higher level thinking that is involved in quantum calculations. A superposition of states is not an intuitive thing for us to think about. But again, in the far future, I do think that the technology will be there. Will it be induced into the human brain through mutation? Maybe, but only if it's deliberately done so, which in Dune, it is. And of course, the rise and fall of empires is another big theme in Dune. It's said that Frank Herbert was partially inspired by the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by historian Edward Gibbon, which today is considered to be not the best historical source for reflecting back on the fall of the Roman Empire, but it basically posits that it was the rise of Christianity that led in large part to the fall of Rome. Whether or not that's necessarily true, since there were a lot of factors that led to the fall of Rome, Herbert was nevertheless inspired by that 
in the works of Ibn Khaldun, an Arab historian, who developed the theory of cyclical history and is basically considered the father of what became historiography and related fields. This influenced Herbert's imagining of cyclical history and the rise and fall of empires. House Atreides, who had been eyeing the throne, were sent to Arrakis to mine and refine spice, and that basically instigates a war. The fallout of this is explored in the other Dune novels and now on screen again in the second and potentially third film of Denis Villeneuve's Dune franchise. Paul is viewed as a messiah figure and in the novels leads another jihad that leads to the fall of the Imperium, cyclical history. That is something that I expect to continue, but That is something that I expect to continue, but it does assume something very dystopian and bleak, but also fairly realistic. That is, Dune takes place in a sort of post-democracy world. You've got all these great houses ruling over the galaxy and the universe, and again, it's like neo-feudalism. In today's age, where we're seeing threats to our democratic institutions and a slow erosion of liberal democratic values, a slip towards authoritarianism, something explored in Star Trek with the post-atomic horror, it proves that democracy is arguably kind of tenuous, sort of an anomaly in human history. The arrangement has traditionally been imperialism, de jure god kings and absolute monarchies, theocracies, that kind of thing. Is that something I could see happening again in the future, especially given a scenario where humans have colonized the galaxy and are living on all these different planets separated by light years? Unfortunately, yes, I think it could happen. It's a danger. If you have planets that are separated by thousands of light years, arguably that does make it easier for authoritarianism and despots ruling over sizable enough populations to seize control and eventually slip us as a species into a post-democracy world. The good news, though, is that this is not a universal opinion. It's not even something that I think will happen, just a possible danger. Others believe that a species that colonizes the galaxy would be inherently peaceful, because it would have had to overcome all the major bigotries and other biases that currently keep us from acting like a truly global species. Different sci-fi universes offer different takes on this, most of them erring on the more pessimistic side. In any event, I think that Dune is a future that we should actively try to avoid. One of my lights went out, but honestly, this looks pretty cool. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. By becoming a patron or member, you get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description too. That's all I have for this week. I'll see you next time.